the Word of Faith Netcast is on the air. Well, praise the Lord. This is Dr. Bill Bailey, and this is the Word of Faith Netcast. I'm glad you could join us once again this week on the Word of Faith Netcast. I've got a lot of things to tell you, not the least of which is that our church, Faith and Victory Church in Greensboro, North Carolina, is now available via a video netcast of the regular services of Faith and Victory Church. Boy, this is big news. You can go to fvc.org. I'll put that right up here on the screen. fvc.org, and you can get in on the services live, at least recorded live, as they happen right there at Faith and Victory Church. And my pastor, Ed Taylor, preaching the Word of God, I'm telling you, you will enjoy the messages that Pastor uh, Ed has for you from Faith and Victory Church. So. Join us there and also join Faith and Victory Church on its new YouTube channel. And I'll put that address right here as well. It is youtube.com slash F-V-C-O-R-G. Okay? Now the website is fvc.org, but the YouTube address is youtube.com slash F-V-C-O-R-G with no dot. Okay? So join us there And I'm telling you, uh, I'm shooting the video, so, you know, if you have complaints about the video, fire them at me. (laughs) But it's just one of the areas that's part of Word of Faith Ministries here, and that is the area of helps. We want to help other ministries. And, of course, this is my home church, my pastor, and so I'm excited about the fact that we're now offering the services over the Internet. All right? Then, of course, Word of Faith Radio. We've got the Word of Faith Radio Radio Rally coming up. Uh, And I'm telling you what, let me just go over here uh, to the Word of Faith Radio website. Hadn't planned on this, of course, uh, but it will give me the information that I need. So let's do that right quick. Don't you love these planned things? Um, Here we go. The Word of Faith Radio Rally will be... Well, there you go. We'll stop the radio there. (laughs) <laughs> because once you go to the website, it starts playing the radio, which is great. WFR.org. All right, Word of Faith Radio Rally will be November the 19th uh, at 3 p.m. Eastern Time at the Assembly of Faith Church at 1030 Lower Dallas Highway, Dallas, North Carolina, featuring my pastor, Ed Taylor, which we just talked about the fact that he's now on the Internet with video. Uh, and, of course, We'll also have a music ministry of musician, songwriter, singer, Linda Lee White from Fairview, Pennsylvania. So I just wanted to read that to you off the website. That's why I had to turn and look at it over here on my desk. But I encourage you to go to the Radio Rally, make plans. we got people coming from all over the country are coming to the Radio Rally there at Assembly of Faith Church in Dallas, North Carolina. So uh, there's information on the website. Check it out. Uh, you, can, you can do a Google map on how to get there by the address, and so we encourage you to come on out to that. Now, taking up a little bit of time with all these announcements, but let's get right in to a continuation of our teaching concerning Greasy Grace, Don't Slide In. You know what I'm saying? Are you lied? Are you misrepresented something? Or whatever. Well, if you do not confess that as sin and get it out of your life, that will start clogging up the pipe between you and the Lord, and you will lose fellowship. You're not not born again. You're still going to heaven, but you lose fellowship. So what 1 John 1, 8 and 9 is for, is for believers to keep the pipe clear. It's the Drano scripture. Oh, boy. I know there's a lot of people going, what? What did he say? (laughs) If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins as we commit them, remember what Brother Copeland says, when you sin, don't run away from God, run to God, 
And that's not when he finds out about it, when you confess it. He already knows. So go to him and say, Father, forgive me. I have sinned. I don't want this to get between you and me. So I want you to forgive me as your scripture says. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The cleansing of all unrighteousness clears out the pipe. And then you have that close, intimate fellowship with the Lord. Okay? That's what that's for. This guy says that that scripture was written to the agnostics. Or, I'm sorry, agnostics. The Gnostics, which were people that were a false doctrine in Paul's day that believed only in what they could see and touch and taste, you know, the five physical senses. They didn't believe anything beyond the five physical senses. They wanted only knowledge, and the more mental knowledge they had, the, the further advanced they thought they were. Okay? So he's saying this scripture was t just talking about Gnostics. It wasn't talking about Christians. And the Gnostics weren't born again, so therefore it's not, it's not talking about people that are born again. Now, why does he say that? Because he just does. He made it up. Now, the, the, the Bible says here, if we look at 1 John, I'm going to go here so I can, can look at it here in my e-sword, e-sword.net. <laughs> Verse 1 says, from That which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, which our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we, 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 hello, have seen it and bear witness. Who bears witness? We. And show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, us who, believers, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you may also have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and his Son Jesus Christ. Who's the our here? Believers, the church. With that we've seen, that we've heard, we declare unto you that you may have fellowship with us, true our fellowships with the Father, with his Son, Jesus Christ, and these things write to you, unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we, believers, say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Who do you have fellowship one with another? Believers. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Who's he talking to? Believers. But if we say we have no sin in our lives as believers, isn't that what he's saying? We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. These folks that are teaching greasy grace don't believe that they have to deal with sin anymore at all. Therefore, they have deceived themselves and the truth is not in them. That's harsh, Dr. Bill, to say the truth's not in them. I'm sorry, that's Bible. I just say Bible. <laughs> I'm not giving opinions, I'm just giving Bible. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Who's the word in? The word is in a believer. Amen? So this chapter is so obviously to believers, you would have to have help to misunderstand that. And I believe the Greasy Grace crowd has help. First, they have a false teacher that's helping them. And secondly, devils. Okay? Doctrines of. <laughs> oh my, I tell you. All right. A Christian can accept Christ and live a life of sin and for the flesh because they're already forgiven and there's no need to leave, live holy and blameless lives. This is what the Greasy Grace folks say. As the Apostle Paul admonished us to do in 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, where he said, For God has not called us to impurity, but to consecration. Oh, oh, there's a word they don't want to hear. Consecration. Oh, man which is to dedicate ourselves to the most thorough purity. This is, by the way, the Amplified I'm reading. Therefore, whoever disregards, sets aside and rejects this, disregards not man but God, whose very spirit, whom he gives to you, is holy, chaste, and pure. Let me go back and read that again out of the Amplified. For God has not called us to impurity, that's sin, but to consecration to dedicate ourselves to the most thorough purity, 
That kind of does away with the preacher that thought he could go out and have an affair and still preach and be anointed. Sorry. Therefore, whoever disregards, sets aside and rejects this fact, disregards not man but God, whose very spirit whom he gives to you is holy, chaste, and pure. In other words, he's not ignoring Dr. Bill saying this. He's ignoring God saying it. I mean, I've got to be straight on all this. All right. Here's something else they teach. Only the revelation of the Apostle Paul is valid because that is where the revelation of grace is found. Now listen to this next statement. Don't bother with Jesus' teaching because that's Old Testament. Or the other New Testament writers because they didn't get the revelation Paul did. So the mindset is we are blessed and nothing else matters. Now, that's me-centric. You know, pastor likes to talk about the, the girl at the uh, slumber party that had on the shirt said it's all about me. Well, the greasy grace crowd, it's all about them. They're me-centric. Now, everything they're teaching here has an element of truth. There's an element there. Some of it's further out than others, but most of it, there's, there's a bit there. The problem is, if you listen to what they're saying, it's easy to slide into that creek bank and get into false doctrine, which is why we're saying these things as sternly as we can. Now, this particular individual, I'm not going to name, because that's not our purpose to name the teachers that are teaching false doctrine. Brother Hagin set a good example by never doing that, and so I'm not going to either. However, you know how pastor has referred to the book Pigs in the Parlor? Has, has he ever referred to who wrote it? I personally don't know who wrote it. <laughs> I've never even thought about it because Pigs in the Parlor represents false doctrine and I'm personally not interested in who originally taught it. Okay? So I'm not going to give this guy's name but you know what I am going to do? I'm going to give his book's name so you can avoid the book. He said, well, yeah, but Dr. Bill, I can go look up on Google who wrote that book. That's up to you. I can go look up who wrote Pigs in the Parlor, but I don't have any interest in doing it. All right, the book is called Destined to Reign. Listen to this title. Destined to Reign. The Secret to Effortless Success, Wholeness, and Victorious Living. Notice effortlessness. It's hard to say. Effortless success. And the, the thing he's saying here is it's effortless because there's nothing we have to do. Remember the key part of the teaching is you don't have to do anything. Basically, it's success without any participation on your part. <laughs> You know, when I say it that way, it sounds so crazy, but that's just what it is. I mean, think about a successful businessman or woman. Can you imagine if they start a business and said, well, I don't have to do anything. I'm going to sit here and count my change. The business is just going to succeed. Listen, I've started several businesses and run a bunch of businesses, and the only way it works is if you work it. You have to W-O- RK a lot to have success. And as a matter of fact, that's, that's sound biblical teaching because the Bible says a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, and it will lead to uh, poverty. So we know that if we work, we get rewarded. This is common sense. If we don't work, we don't get rewarded. And the same thing is true when it comes to spiritual things. Now, I'm not saying that work, as in your personal works, can get you born again. That is not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that you will be rewarded for what you do in this life. That is 100% scriptural. There's another thing these greasy grace folks teach. There is no judgment for Christians. Hello? What about the judgment seat of Christ? for believers, what's called the Bema Seat, where we're given a reward based on the works that we do for him in the flesh. Now, 
them that don't do anything, they still got heaven, they still got gold streets, and they still got mansions. That's pretty good. You know what I'm saying? But if you do some things for the Lord, you get a reward because that's God's way. That's why he set up the system. That's why he set up the earth to work the way it does, that you work and you get rewarded for your work. Now, here's the problem. Attitude. When I go to work every day, I work at a job I enjoy. I work at a job that I like. I kind of jokingly say, I'd go do it if I didn't get paid. That's eh, not entirely true. <laughs> Got to watch what I say. But I do enjoy it a lot. And I have a lot of fun with it. So when it, the Bible says it's under the curse to work by the sweat of our brow, we don't have to work by the sweat of our brow. We can go enjoy our work. And we can be rewarded internally even for our work. I like the feeling I get of a job well done. I like putting together electronic systems and computer systems and software and get it all just so and have it work just like it was designed to and see it just running and humming along. That, that is exciting to me. You know, I kid with Ben that I'm not much of a gamer, but, but to me the game <laughs> is to make the computer build it, get it running, get the software on it running just right, and see it humming along happily. That's my game. That's my fun. He said, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. Well, if you're a system administrator and you really enjoy it, that's fun. So my attitude toward work is a good work ethic. Right. That's what we're talking about. Now, these folks that are occupying Wall Street, they do not have a good work ethic. Matter of fact, it reminds me of Maynard G. Krebs on... The Dobie Gillis show. I don't know if you're old enough to remember that. I am. But, you know, Dobie uh, would, would say something to Maynard about going, doing some kind of work, and Maynard would go, work! <laughs> work! <laughs> it was a dirty word to him, a four-letter word, work. And that's the way these people are on the Occupy Wall Street thing. We don't want to work. We just want the government to give us everything. Well, man, they'd fall right in with the Greasy Grace crowd. And as a matter of fact, that's the point. The Greasy Grace teaching is a manifestation in the church of what's going on in the world. It's the same spirit. There's revelation in that that you need to chew on. Let's have a Salem moment here. What's going on in the world leaks over into the church, unfortunately. And the doctrine of the Occupy Wall Street crowd is forgive all the financial debt of everybody and you don't have to work and if you want to work okay go ahead and work but everybody should get paid the same thing and everybody should get paid enough they don't have to worry about anything give everybody a house and on and on and on and on and on stuff that you just cannot do it just wouldn't work there's not that much money laying around <laughs> to do that for everybody in the earth. Do you know we just passed the seven billionth person born on the earth? Seven billion people all having a living wage that is enough that they don't have to worry about anything and they never have to think about finances. Well, you know, that's great and that's heaven, but we're not in heaven, we're on earth. And that means, you know what Jesus said about that? He said, the poor you'll have with you always. Well, he shouldn't have said that because we want, we want to make sure nobody's poor. Well, he was talking reality and they're talking crazy. No, we can't have in this world a society in which everyone has everything period, Jesus said that that was not going to be the case. If the poor you will have with you always, and he always said the truth, then that's just the way it is. I'm sorry. I'd love for it to be otherwise, but it's not. Now, given that, what determines whether you are financially blessed or wealthy or whether you're poor and begging on the street? Effort. Either in the physical realm to work a job or in the spiritual realm to believe God 
be a tither, be a giver, and work a job. <laughs> you know, there's no excuse for not working the job. Them that don't work, don't eat. <laughs> Amen. That's what the scripture says. Oh, Dr. Bill, you're being too hard. It's just Bible. Just Bible. All right. This book, Destined to Reign, The Secret to Effortless Success, Wholeness, and Victorious Living. Here are quotes from the book. You know, if you don't directly quote the source, you can't really address it. You know what I'm saying? So we did a little research here. Here's a quote. Do you realize that most people believe that one needs to work hard to achieve success in life? Wow. The world system of success is built on the twin pillars of self-effort and diligence. Talk about ugly words. Diligence. Ugh. Wait a minute. The Bible says to be diligent, doesn't it? Hmm. That's what the guy says. There are always some laws that you have to, he puts it in quotes, that you have to abide by and some, quote, methods and techniques that you have to keep on practicing before you can see any results. That's just harsh, isn't it? No, that's just reality. Most of the time, the result that you may get will start to fade once you cease to follow through with the prescribed methods and steps. In other words, when you quit working, you get poor. What a shock. You quit being diligent, you don't have anything seems to come as a, as a revelation to him that that's the case. But see, what he's teaching is you don't have to do that. You don't have to be diligent. You don't have to work. You don't have to do anything. It's just going to get handed to you. See, that's this Occupy Wall Street crowd's doctrine right there. Whew. Okay. He goes on to say, We have been taught to focus on achieving, on doing, and on relying on our self-efforts. We are driven to do, do, do. Forgetting that Christianity is actually done, done, done. You remember pastor up on the board over here? Looking at what was done and what you do. It's very clear that there are some things that are done. Jesus did it all. He achieved what needed to be achieved for us to be born again. But there are things left for us to do. And that's the part he's rejecting here. He goes on to say, the world tells you that the more you do, the harder you work, the more hours you put in, the more success you will achieve. The world's way is to nag you to work harder, to forget about attending church on Sundays, to spend less time with your wife and kids, and to spend more time in the office working the nights, weekends, and holidays. Again, an element of truth there. The world does say, why do you go to church? You could be working, you could be making money. But what he's shooting down is diligence as opposed to sitting back. That's really the key of what he's saying. <clears throat> Another quote here. By the way, that was from page four of the book. Next quote. My friend, the spirit of Jesus and the new covenant of grace is not, listen to this, is not the spirit of the old covenant of law during Elijah's time. It's a different spirit. So you're telling me that the spirit of God that was on Elijah is not the spirit that's in the New Testament? Hello? It's the same Holy Ghost. Now, the Holy Ghost may be ministering in a different dispensation now than he did in the Old Testament, but guess what? Same Holy Ghost. The, the, the anointing that came upon Elijah is the anointing that comes upon us. It's not what he says, page 51 and 52 of his book. Next quote, a Christian cannot commit the unpardonable sin. There is no sin the Christian is not forgiven of already. Well, the unpardonable sin is specifically talking about Christians who, even though they know better, sacrifice again Jesus because they reject what he's done for them. And you can look at... Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, 1 through the rest of that chapter, it talks about all the qualifications that somebody has to have in order to be in that position that they could reject Jesus willfully, completely, wholly, knowing what they're doing. We're not talking about a young Christian that thinks they've rejected Jesus and, and, and maybe has committed the unpardonable sin. If they're worried about it, they haven't done it. 
because those that have done it for real know what they have done and they're not interested in coming back to the Lord. Man, I can't imagine anybody like that, but even so. A Christian can't commit the unpardonable sin. Well, sorry, they're the only ones that could. Why even talk about it? Anyway. Uh, on 1 John 1, 9, we talked about earlier, people have taken this verse and built a whole doctrine around it when actually chapter 1 of 1 John was written to the Gnostics who were unbelievers. Again, we read it earlier. How can that be to unbelievers? It's on page 106. Page 134 says, Does the Holy Spirit convict you of sin, believer? I put believer in there. This is what he says. Does the Holy Spirit convict you of sin? That's a very good question, and the answer is really simple. Now pay attention to this because it will liberate you. The bottom line is that the Holy Spirit never convicts you of sin. This is what the guy says. Does anybody know in, that the Bible says the Holy Ghost convicts of sin? That's what it flat out says. He contradicts the Bible. There you go. Another quote. The Holy Spirit... Okay, I read that. Next quote. For generations, the body of Christ has been defeated and put under a constant siege of condemnation from the accuser because they believe wrongly that the Holy Spirit convicts believers of their sins. It's on page 139 in his book. So what he's rejecting is that we can commit sin anymore. Now, you know that this is just, the, just at the tip of the precipice of falling over and saying, well, then there's no reason anybody needs to get born again. Because if sin has been taken care of, then why do we need to get people to confess Jesus is Lord and believe God raised him from the dead? They're just all born again. So let's just all go home. That's exactly, that's called universalism. And that's where they're headed. Mark it down. This group, Greasy Grace Doctrine and folks, are headed well, for universalism. We'll have to stop right there and pick up again next week. We'll try to conclude it next week on the, uh, the next netcast. But Greasy Grace, don't slide in. You can get that audio, the entire audio of the message, on the website. And you simply go to wofm.org, and I'll put it right here on the screen, wofm.org. Go there. You can go to Messages by Dr. Bill. It's one of the links. Click on that right at the top. And then you'll see where you can listen to it online or you can download it directly and share it with your friends. I encourage you to do that because this is an important and vital message for the body of Christ today. Now, we'd love to hear from you. You can write us here at Word of Faith Ministries. Word of Faith Ministries is at P.O. Box 5213-5213. High Point, North Carolina, the zip code 27262. And of course, you can always write me at our email address, which is drbill, D-R-B-I-L-L, -L, at W-O-F-M dot O-R-G. Join us again next week for next week's conclusion of this message on Greasy Grace. Don't slide in. And remember until then to fulfill the Word of God. The Word of Faith Netcast is brought to you by Word of Faith Ministries and our partners around the world.